today we are going to discuss analysis of drive to the combing machine. Combard is a very complex machine. There are different types of mechanisms which are working together and giving drive to different organs of the machine. Some of the drive is little simple in nature, but some of them are bit complex. So, if we try to see the gearing plan of a comber as shown here, then you see that in this particular, this is a part of the whole you know, gearing diagram, not the entire diagram is not here, because we cannot accommodate the entire diagram in one slide. So, part of the diagram is shown here and we see here that there are three motors which are driving this part of the machine. And the arrows, if we look at the arrows, the arrows is actually showing how is the motion from the motor is getting transmitted. That is how the motion is flowing. What we see it here that the from the motor, the motor pulley exists A. A gives drives to B and from B, the shaft on which the pulley B is mounted that turns and this shaft, on this shaft we see quite a few gears. Now, first of all let us look at the gear C. Now, from C is connected to another very large gear which is D and this large gear D actually holds the cylinder shaft. Therefore, the cylinder comb is receiving its drive from the motor through the gears A or through the pulley first of all, A to B both are pulleys then gear C and D. The motion goes to the cylinder shaft and all the cylinder combs are mounted on the cylinder shaft. So, that is how the motion goes to the cylinder shaft. So, this particular part of the drive is quite simple. As a result, the cylinder will turn at a fixed speed or a constant rotation. Now, on D, if you see there is a lever which is connected, this orange arrow is showing connected to the rocking shaft. So, from gear D through the sliding and the slider and this arm, we pass on the drive to the rocking shaft, the shaft which continuously turns back and forth. So, the motion is transmitted to the rocking shaft as the rocking shaft is shown here and this particular arrow indicates, both side arrow indicates that it is basically rocking. It turns both in clockwise and anti-clockwise directions. And from here, the motion goes to an eccentric as shown it here and the eccentric if you remember that the lap sheet is passed on an eccentric or little cam which is there and from there the sheet is passed to the feed roller. So, the eccentric receives a drive from this rocking shaft. The other part of the rocking shaft we have already you know discussed earlier that as this rocking motion is translated into and to and fro motion of the entire Nipper assembly through a set of levers or links. The other interesting part of the drive analysis here is this that from the central shaft which is on which the all the comb cylinders are mounted, we see here that on this shaft there is this gear this gear is driving a set of gears over here, where the drive part is very complex in nature. Here exists what is known as differential gear drive. We will separately discuss this in, in some other you know, uh, your lectures, but what we see here that this part of the drive where the differential exists the differential output is fed to two 
detaching rollers. So, detaching rollers are also shown here. So, detaching rollers gets its drive from the main cylinder shaft as well as it also gets a drive. See on the cylinder shaft here is mounted another conjugate cam and links. Through that also we feed motion as shown here by these blue arrows. If you look at the blue arrows, the blue arrows is feeding motion. So, one motion is being fed from this side, it goes to the differential gear and the other constant motion is also fed from the cylinder shaft. So, you are feeding two motions to the differential gear part of the machine which is the output of which finally goes to the detaching rollers. This anyway as I said that we will take it up later in little details. So, the drive goes to the detaching rollers. The other part of the drive here is the drive given to the cleaning roller that is the brush. If you see it here, there is an independent motor E over here. E through the pulleys drive the brush roller. The brush roller contains brush on its surface and this brush is actually cleaning the needles of the cylinder comb. So, the brush turns at a constant speed depending upon the speed of the motor and the diameter ratio of the two pulleys which is shown here. So, this is the motion transmission path that is from the motor it goes to the pulley F and pulley F is mounted on a shaft on which all the brush rollers are also mounted. The other part of the drive if we go here that is we go to this pulley B from here on this shaft we have quite a few gears. We have gear C, gear G and if we go further there are some more gears over here. From this shaft what happens? Through gear G, the motion is transferred to the drive to another gear H and H is in turn driving the other part of the machine which we will show it later on. So, the machine from here the motion flows to the rest of the part. The other parts which are left are basically the guiding rollers on the table on which the slivers run and then drive that we need to give to the uh, drafting rollers of the draw box and then also we need to give drive to the can within which we are going to place our sliver. So, that drive through H is will flow to all those parts of the machine. The other drive which is important here is that through a set of gears shown by the violet arrows, if you look concentrate on the violet arrows, then we will see that through this the motion is flowing where if you trace the path the violet arrow actually is going behind almost to the machine and it is driving the lap rollers. So, this part through this as shown by the violet arrows the motion is transmitted to the lap roller lap sits on the lap roller and the lap roller is also turned a bit in each and every cycle. So, that the lap is unwound and fed to the combing head. So, that is how the motion is going there. The other motion through this kind of so, if you look at the, the gear these two gears is from here it goes to the calendar rollers. As the sliver is passed through the trumpet, as soon as they are collected from the tray, the fleece is collected on a tray and from the tray it passes through a nozzle and from there we pull it out and compress it using the calendar roller. So, here we have a set of calendar rollers and this is how the drive goes to the calendar rollers. So, this is how the, the gearing plan looks like and 
the way the motion flows to the different parts of the machine. It is very important to understand the gearing diagram of any machine because this will help us to identify or to diagnose any mechanical fault that may occur which can affect the performance of the machine or can affect the quality of the saliva that we produce. The quality of the saliva or the efficiency of the machine many times depends upon the mechanical faults with the drives. So, one must have a proper understanding of the gearing plan of any machine that he is going to work on and the way the motion is actually flowing from the main drive point to the different parts that understanding also should be clear. So, from there we go to the next slide now. This part as I said the other part of the drive is drive to the draw box. Each and every comber has a draw box which is nothing but a small drafting unit where rollers are there. So, the motion as I said it receives comes over look at this orange arrow from the previous section and then it is being fed to the drafting unit of the draw box. So, you look at the, the blue arrows, the sky blue arrows especially which are shown here. This is how the motion is flowing and to the different drafting rollers and from there you see also it is going towards the can and also going towards the calendar rollers. So, the source of the motions in this case are basically three different motors and from there the motion is actually flowing to different parts of the machine. So, if there is any obstruction created to the motion flow due to something going wrong, maybe the gears are not properly fitted or maybe some gear tooth is damaged or there is a play between the gears or there could be possibility of the, the belt being loose. There are many things which can happen and all these will lead to some kind of disturbance to the flow of motion and as a result its effect will be seen in the quality of the material that we are going to produce. Next the drive to the can is further you know, again shown in this slide the drive origins from the draw box and flows to the can table. If you again the arrows are basically drawn here to show the way the motion is flowing and it goes to the can table to the coiler plate and the coiler calendar rollers. We know that for packaging we need a drum which we call can. The can has to turn. Also there are some you know, machine manufacturers who have developed the packaging unit where the can may not rotate also and we can still form the coils and lay the uh, saliva in the form of coils within the coil. However, there are also machine manufacturers who has designed this whole mechanism in such a way that the can also turns a bit. So, can rest on the table and the table or the platform which is at the bottom and this also turns slowly. The other thing is that there is a coiler plate as we have already may be knowing because these things are similar to what we have seen in the case of draw frame can drive or carding machine can drive all are basically similar. What we need is to turn the plate on which the can is going to rest or you can say turntable. The coiler plate also we have to rotate because we have to form the coils and we have to also rotate the your uh, coil or calendar rollers which will pull the slivers, force it to pass through the trumpet and the inclined you know, tube which is there uh, in the coiler plate and through that then it will be led by the rotation of the coiler plate in the form of circular coils within the can. So, this is how we look at the drive here. From there 
we go to this slide where we want to show you the way you can calculate the certain speeds. Speed calculation is very simple. Uh, since you have already calculated speeds of rollers or gears in you no, know, maybe in the while well, uh, learning about the draw frame of carding machines. So, here also if we see the, how do we find out the speed of the cylinder shaft or the cylinder combing cylinder. Look at this diagram for motor 1, motor 1 if you see the pulleys are there D 1, D 2 and the gear trees are you know, N 1, N 2. So, you can say that speed of the cylinder is basically motor speed in RPM ratio of D 1, D 2 and N 1, N 2. So, with this we can easily find out if they are given what is the speed of the cylinder. Typical cylinder speed, comb cylinder speed in a combing machine could be to the order of anything between 200 to 400 depending upon the you know, type of machine, the manufacture of the machines, how old is the machines are, we actually decide at what speed we should run. It also depends on the quality of the fibers we are going to process, the quality of the back process that we have. So, the speed range is between 200 to 400, but what should be the exact speed that we should choose depends on many other factors. The speed of the rocking shaft, as I said rocking shaft speed can also be calculated as is shown by from this diagram. Rocking shaft is basically rocking. So, its frequency of rocking we can calculate. Here yeah, speed does not mean that is rotational speed, but actually is frequency of oscillation we can say, we can calculate. The other thing is speed of the brush roller in this case is also simple. There is another motor 2 and the if the diameter ratio of the two pulleys are D 3 by D 4, then motor speed into D 3 by D 4 will give you the speed of the brush. We have to choose the speed of the brass in such a way that the brass should be capable to strip the fibers from the surface of the needles of the cylinder. So, what we should know is what is the surface speed at the tip of the brasses and what is the surface speed of the cylinder comb at the tip of the needles. The surface speed of the brush should be little more because it has to strip it. So, depending upon therefore, the diameter and the tip of the brushes and also diameter and the tip of the needles of the cylinder comb, we should can find it out or we should can decide what should be the speeds, the rotational speed of the brush. Ultimately, the purpose is that you should be able to strip the surface of the needles of the cylinder comb. So, surface speed has to be little bit more, otherwise stripping will be little difficult. Next comes the most the difficult part of the drive of the machine which we call detaching roller drive, because if you, you know by now that detaching roller has to turn forward and backward. So, this motion has to be created. It has a complex driving mechanism, it turns clockwise and anticlockwise direction in each combing cycle. So, that the combing fleece, fleece is detached, moves forward, but it is again turned back. Why do you turn it back? Because we have to go for what? We have to go for piecing. So, because piecing is required, therefore, the detached fringe has to be turned back. So, the part of it hangs and when the new fringe comes in the next cycle, the forward end of the new fringe must overlap on the trailing part of the previously detached fringe. So, therefore, the entire fringe cannot be moved forward it has to turn back a bit because we have to go for piecing operations in order to maintain the continuity. So, because of this kind of motion that we have to generate mechanically. So, what has been done by our 
the machine you know, the manufacturers that there are two drive sources, a constant drive from the cylinder shaft and a variable from the conjugate cam with the link mechanism that we have. These two drives or these two rotation you can say are mechanically combined or they are integrated by differential gear. The purpose of differential gear is to add or subtract two motions and give or produce a resultant motion. So, to understand this part, we need to first know what is epicyclic gear and what is or what is the planetary gear mechanism, both meaning same. Will let us first try to understand this a bit planetary gear mechanism. Here, first of all, we are showing you a simple gear train. This is what is very familiar with you. And what we see here, there are gears N2, N3, N5, N4, N6, a set of gears are here. In this gear, the gear 3 is an idler. Idler basically means what? What do we, which gear we call it an idle gear? Idle gear will not have any effect on the final speed of the output gear. It will only change the direction of rotation. The whole purpose of an idle gear is to change the direction of rotation of the subsequent gear but it does not have any effect on the speed of the final gear. So, in this case gear 3 is the idle gear whereas, gear 2, 3, 5 are basically drive gears, so, drive the driver. So, there is a gears therefore, can be classified as driver gears, driven gears and ideal gears. In any gear train we can classify the gears into three types. Now, if I want to find out the speed of the last gear 6 in this case, so n 6, small n 6 indicates the speed of the sixth gear and let us say the capital n 6, capital n 5, these are the number of teeth that we have on those gears. So, n 6, small n 6, speed of the sixth gear is going to be minus, minus side indicates the direction or speed of the last gear with respect to the direction or speed of the first gear. If they are in the same direction, then you will say, you can say, you can write a positive sign or no sign basically means the input gears and the output gear are turning in the same directions. If not, then we can give a minus sign minus sign will indicate that there is a direct change in direction of speed. So, that is why the negative sign is coming. Otherwise, it is speed of the input gear which is N 2 multiplied by capital N 2 into capital N 3 into capital N 5 by capital N 3, capital N 4, capital N 6. These capital Ns are representing the teeth in the respective gears. So, therefore, it is basically capital N 2 by N 3, N 3 by N 4, N 5 by N 6. So, the train value E in this case is product of driving tooth numbers divided by product of driven tooth numbers. So, in this case N 2, N 3 and N 5 are driving gears whereas, the which are shown in the bottom are driven gears. N 3 the only gear which this number appears both on the you know, numerator and denominator because it is the idle gear because it for N 2 it is a driven gear N 3 whereas, for N 4 it is drive gear. So, it plays a dual role as a drive gear as a driven gear. Hence, it appears both in numerator and denominator, but you see other gears are not N 2 and N 5 is only in the numerator because they are always drive gears, whereas the N 4 and N 6 are always driven gears. So, the train value we say it is the product of driving tooth numbers that is 
this n2, n3, n5 or n3, n4, n6. I can cancel n3 and I can take this is ratio of n2, n5 by n4, n6 also. So, as it stated previously, E is positive if the large gear rotates in the same sense as that of first and E is negative if the large gear rotates in the opposite sense. So, we can write that n small n l speed of the last gear is E into small n f. This is for simple gear trend. Now, take simply epicyclic or planetary gears now. We will try to understand this. What it is? Now, here in the diagram you can see two gears A and B and they are connected by an arm which is C. So, there are two gears A and B and they are connected by an arm C. While A and B are free to rotate on their own individual axis, both the wheels, they can turn on their own axis. In this case, A is called the sun gear and B is called the planet gear. So, A because B can also turn on the periphery of A, you can rotate around A also. So, therefore, it behaves like a planet where A is behaves like a star and B behaves like a planet. So, you call it sun and planet like earth is rotating around sun, a similar concept. So, B can turn on its own axis and B can roll on the periphery of A also. Now, now first one let us say arm C is stationary that is the arm is not turned at all. Imagine that I am not turning the arm, arm C is held in position and wheel A rotates, wheel A I rotate it. What will happen? Wheel B you rotate by A by B times the revolution of A, where this A and B also indicating the number of teeth in wheel A and wheel B. So, if I turn the wheel A by one revolution, then B will rotate by how many revolution? B will rotate by 1 into A by B revolutions number of teeth in A is capital A that is also indicating number of teeth. So, A by B. So, 1 into A by B in this case is the revolution of B that is what we will get if the arm is stationary and only A is turning alright. The, uh, the another situation, situation 2 is what? Will A and B are both fixed? solidly on the arm C and the C rotates by one revolution. I rotate only the arm, but not the gear A. In the previous situation, arm was fixed, A was turned by one revolution. In next, this situation is different, only the arm is turning. Result will be both A and B will rotate by one revolution if I do so this is what is going to happen. Both wheels A and B are free to rotate on their own axis and now A is stationary and arm C is rotated. The result will be wheel B will receive now two motions. One is because of this gearing with wheel A and motion because of the arm is also rotating. If teeth on A and B are same, let us say both are in this diagram it appears the A is bigger than B, but imagine that A and B are same in size. The rotation of the arm by one revolution will make B to rotate by two revolution because one revolution it will get because of the arm is turning rotating, another revolution it will get because it is geared with A. So, rotation of the arm 
by 1 revolution in this case will make the wheel B to rotate by 2 revolutions. This experiment one can do by choosing 2 gears of exactly same size and turning one gear over the other for one complete revolution and see how many revolution the suppose the gear B receives. Now from there we go to the planetary gear train. An example is shown here. The planetary gear is shown on the right hand side of the diagram. What we see here that at a three gears A, B and C, they are connected by arm D. So, planetary gears are B and C and in this case sun gear is A. N A, N B and capital N C all are teeth in gears A, B, C. If arm D is fixed, the velocity ratio is going to be A by C because B is behaving like an idler in this case. B will not have any influence on the speed of C. The, if A turns, B will receive motion from A and that motion will be transmitted to C, but B will behave like an idler in this case and therefore, the velocity, the rotational speed of C will only depend upon the number of teeth that A is having. So, the velocity ratio in this case is going to be A by C and the sign is positive because if A turns in clockwise direction, C will also turn in clockwise direction. Therefore, this is A by C and we write a positive sign. The velocity ratio using number of teeth is also known as epicyclic ratio. So, we call in this case that small e is plus n a by n c. So, this is the ratio of number of teeth of gear a and gear c. So, e is positive, positive sign is because the direction of rotation of the input gear, sun gear is ex and the direction of rotation of the output gear are basically exactly same. Let the rotational speed of A be small f. So, now let us say A is turning at a speed of small f. Arm is also turning at a speed of A, small a. So, now there are two motions. A rotates on its own axis at a speed small f the arm D also rotates around the axis of A at a speed small a. So, we are interested to know the rotational speed of C now, which is let us say is L. So, L is the output speed, F is the speed of the sun gear in this case and d at small a is the speed of the arm. So, L is going to be some function of f and a, but what is going to be that function that is what we need to know. So, that we can find out L angular velocity of gear a relative to arm d that is small n a d is going to be f minus a because the gear is rotating, sun gear rotating at the speed of small f, arm is also rotating at the speed of small a and both are rotating in the same direction, both are let us say clockwise. So, angular velocity of gear a relative to the arm is going to be f minus a and we write it as small n a d indicates a relative to arm d. So, n a d. Velocity of the gear C relative to arm D is going to be how much? If that is L and the arm is turning as A, it is going to be L minus A. So, small n C D is going to be L minus A. If I take the ratio of these two, small n C D by small n A D is going to be small a minus A by F minus A, that is equation number 3 it expresses the ratio of relative speed of gear C to that of gear A. 
and both speeds are relative to the arm d. This ratio is same and is proportional to the tooth numbers or which we call epicyclic ratio, whether the arm is rotating or not. Therefore, we can write the epicyclic ratio E is actually going to be small a minus a by small f minus a and this will help us to find out the speed of the output gear when speed of the input gear, speed of the arm and the epicyclic ratio are known to us. This is the equation that is what is to be used whenever we encounter a differential gear and we want to find out the speeds of the output gear. So, you have to remember that L is the speed of gear C which is the output gear, A is the rotation of the arm D, so it is called it small a, F is the initial speed or input speed of the sun gear capital, that is in this case capital A. So, F A and small l are shown in the diagram also and you should remember this simple formula E is equal to small a minus a by F minus a. Many a times for calculation of speed we use this, you know, take the help of this table. Now, the same equation I can write in terms of L is going to be a plus e into f minus a. It is nothing but the previous equation written in different form that is L is normally will be the unknown speed of the output gear. So, it is arm speed a plus e into f minus a. Now, if we concentrate on this table, what this table is let us try to understand on the there are four different columns. First column we write the operating conditions. Then second column we write input gear sun, sun gear A, then the arm D and the next one is C where C indicates the, in this case the output gear. So, A, D, C and the last we are making writing some comment. Not necessary that you have to write when I do the calculation the last column will not be there because it is for understanding purpose we have written it here. Otherwise, only the operating conditions if you want to write you can write, but if you can imagine then you can directly use the equation and find out the speed. Sometimes A E F will be given you have to find out L, or sometimes L will be given E will be given you have to find out what is A. So, there could be different types of numericals where you may need to find out either L or A or E or F that are basically how many parameters in this equation that are L, A, E and F four parameters are there. So, these four numericals could be there where that could be three parameters will be given and you have to find out the four parameters. Now, now let us look at this operating conditions what we have written. First operating condition is gear is fixed on arm D. When the gear is fixed on arm D, all the gears are fixed on arm D and the arm rotates by the speed A. So, last column is showing that arms are rotates at speed A and the gears is fixed on D. In this case what will happen? A, D, C all will turn at the same speed A. So, whatever is the arm speed that is going to be the speed of A that is going to be the speed of C as well. The next one is arm is fixed you have to imagine if the arm is fixed that means the D is going to be the speed of D is going to be 0 that is basically basically means in this case A is going to be 0. So, you write below D in the second row we write 0 here because D is not turning at all. So, we write instead of A we write it 0 here. Now, 
speed of a we write here f minus a so that the sum total of column 1 becomes f. See at the bottom what we write in the last row addition of 1 and 2 will give me f under a will give me a under b and will give me l under c. So, if we want to get f here under a I have to write f minus a here. If I want to get a here automatically because a is the first row second row shows 0. So, if I sum total of 1 and 2 rows will give me a here and in the last what is l that comes. Now, here if you look at it what we have written that when a is 0 arm is not turning if the speed of a is f minus a speed of c is going to be e into f minus a whatever is the velocity ratio that it will behave like a simple gear train now the gear train with which you are all familiar with that is simple gear train. So, when behave like a simple gear train speed of c is going to be e into f minus a. Now, so and we write under c l. So, l is becoming what a plus e into f minus a that is what we have written in equation 5 l is equal to a plus e into f minus a d is going to be 0 uh, sorry a because it is a plus 0 is a and a is going to be a plus f minus a. So, what will happen? a and a will cancel f will be left out. So, this is how it looks like and if you remember the formula and or you can make a table and write the speeds of respective gears for two different conditions and work out. So, applications of such kind of epicyclic gears as normal transmission gear capable of high reduction ratio this is also used and in differential gear for adding and subtracting motions from two different sources you have to remember this that whenever we need to add and subtract motions from two different sources that is two motions are there and we want to add them or we want to subtract one motion to the from the other we need to take the help of this specific type of gears we call it differential gear then. So, differential gear is basically a type of epicyclic gear. The other one is that it has a high reduction ratio. When you want a very huge drop in speed ratio, as so 1 is to 20, or in that sort of thing, then we have to sometimes using a bigger gear and a smaller gear it may not be advisable in some situations, or you may need quite a few gears to bring down the speed by a very large amount. In that case, we need to take the help of the epicyclic gear trend which will give you high reduction ratio. Another example is also shown so that uh, become little more you know it understanding become little more clear. This is also a kind of epicyclic gear, but you see the design is different wheel A and B are internal gears. So, there is a wheel A shown by the uh, yellow color and wheel B both are internal gears. So, they have teeth in their internal periphery. Normally, we find teeth on the outer surface of a gear, but here the teeth are in the inner surface of the gear. So, that is why they are called internal gears. B is free to rotate independently about the center O as shown it here. While wheel C and D form compound carrier with center Q. Look at the two gears C and D which are green in color. The C is visible, part of D is visible because in front of D we have the gear A. So, it is not visible. 
but C and D form a compound carrier. We sent that Q and now they are carried by an arm E. C is missing with A. If you look at carefully, C is in contact internally. So, C has teeth on its periphery and these teeth are internally connected to the teeth of gear A. Similarly, B is having internal teeth, but D is having external teeth on its surface and D is meshing with the gear B. If arm E rotates by one revolution, how many revolutions the wheel B will make? This question is raised. The teeth of the gears are shown under the diagram, A having 22 teeth, B having 23 teeth, C 19 and D 20. The question raised is how many revolution wheel B will make if arm E rotates by one revolution. So, the solution is given. First, we will find out what is the epicyclic ratio. So, epicyclic ratio is the ratio of teeth of the respective gears. You have to understand which is missing with whom. So, E in this case is going to be A is missing with C. So, it will be A by C into D by B and the teeth are given. We write, take the ratio, find out the value and we put a sign which is positive. You have to be very careful about this, is what is going to be the sign of E? Is it positive or negative? And you have to imagine in this case, the if the gear A turns in a clockwise direction or sorry, in this case, I, I turn it in anti clockwise direction. You can take it clockwise or it does not matter. And you now imagine what is going to be the direction of rotation of B. You have to do the exercise mentally. If you do it, you will find it that B is also turning in the same anti clockwise direction. And therefore, we should write E equal to plus 440 by 437, that is equal to 1.0068, that is the value of E. Now, we write E rotates by one revolution. How many revolution B will make? That is the question. So, we take the formula E is equal to L minus A by F minus A and we write the values. We do not know what is going to be the L. So, L is the unknown part. A has been given that arm rotates by one revolution. So, I put arm rotation as 1, the value of A is 1. And what is the rotation of the gear A? it has not been given. So, A rotation which is F, this is 0 here because F A does not rotate in this case, in this particular example. So, it write 0 here. So, this is the values we keep put and we can find out what is going to be the L. So, L is going to be therefore, this minus 3 by 437. So, if I have a gear like this, if that means if the arm rotates by one revolution, gear B is rotating 3 by 437 revolution. So, you can see there is a huge reduction in speed. So, that is in this case, we can see this is acting as a very high reduction in speed or light. Now, we come to our real drive that is which is detaching roller drive. Detaching roller drive, if you look at the drive, this is how we have shown it earlier, the detaching the gear, the differential gear which exists in the machine looks like this and here it is shown if we look at this part where the differential gear exists, then we will see that in the, see there is one speed input, the differential gear is basically there is a big gear in the previous diagram we have shown it on which there are three sets of gears are there mounted. And the bigger gear also acts like an arm. Like 
in this case the 95 teeth gear basically is the big gear that we have seen in the previous diagram and that acts as a arm. It receives a speed from the cylinder shaft through the gear 15 teeth, 15, 56 and 95. If you look at this, these three, so the cylinder shaft is driving this bigger gear through the intermediate 56 idle gear and then turning this gear 95 teeth gear. And then the other thing is on the same big gear that has three small gears. If you look go back to the previous slide again, you see this one that there is a bigger gear this one and then on which there are three sets of gears and one side and the other side also we have a gear here from there the output goes to the detaching rollers. These three sets of gears are there because we have to also make sure that it is properly balanced. So, some we need an extra set of gears to make sure that they balance properly so therefore, uh, also is required. The other thing is that these gears, so this bigger gear receives most constant motion from the cylinder shaft. The small gear over here that you see here, these gears are also being is basically this one. The green that you see this side, this is receiving its motion from another small gear which is connected to the conjugate cam through links and all. So, that is the variable part of the drive that it receives. So, if we look at this part of the drive, this part of the drive, then we will see that what is the, I have to calculate what is my epicyclic ratio in the first case. Epicyclic ratio in this case is going to be, say the input is 33 teeth gear is connecting to 21, 21 is actually resting on the big gear 95 teeth. So, 33 gears is connected through these links to the conjugate cam and it receives motion which is a, a kind of motion which is, is receiving from the cam side. The other motion the drive this the differential gear received is from the cylinder shaft through the teeth 15 teeth gear and as this gear is also feeding motion to the differential gear. So, differential gear receives motion from two different sources, one from the cylinder shaft and the other cylinder shaft through a conjugate cam and link which is a very complex kind of drive, but through that also it receives motions and therefore, these two motions are now added together. So, let us first find out what is the epicyclic ratio. If I know the gear teeth of the differential gear in this case is 33, 21, 29 and 25. So, epicyclic ratio is going to be 33 by 21 into 29 by 25 which is 1.83 and this is going to be positive. If you imagine, you will find that if the 33 gear rotates in one direction in clockwise direction, what is the rotational direction of 25th teeth gear? If I say 33 teeth gear is the input, what is going to be the, the direction of rotation of 25th teeth gear? If you find it out, we will find this is in the same direction and therefore, it is plus 1.83. So, one revolution of cylinder comb shaft, the arm will rotate by how much? Because we know there are two inputs. Let us first find out if the cylinder shaft rotates by one revolution, that is one cycle we are considering. So, cylinder shaft rotates by one full turn, one complete cycle. The arm wheel, which is 95th wheel is going to rotate by how many turns? A 1 into 15 by 56, 56 by 95, 15 is acting as idle gear, 
that value is 0 0.1597. That means, one rotation of the cylinder shaft causes the arm which is the big gear by only 0 0.1579 turn. It does not rotate by full turn also, it only rotates a fraction of its revolution when cylinder rotates by one complete revolution. The other thing is the motion that the gear 33 teeth gear passes on to the 21 teeth gear for one revolution of the cylinder shaft. That if we want to find it out, here the revolution of the cylinder shaft we have already calculated which is the you know, revolution of this for one revolution of the cylinder shaft, the rotational motion that the 95th teeth gear receives which is A is 0.1579 we have already found it out. Now, the fraction revolution of the arm utilized for backward movement is 0 0.1579 by 4 that is 0 0.0395 forward movement duration because now you have to check from the index you know, your the timing diagram of the combing machine if you go then you will find that the forward rotation and the backward rotation if we try to find out then you will find the backward rotation is from is for 10 index number duration. That means, it is one fourth. So, one fourth fraction revolution of the arm utilized for backward movement is going to be one fourth of 0 0.1579. So, you write 1579 divided by 4 is going to be 0 0.0395. In one cycle, the 33 t teeth gear rotates by 4 teeth. This also one has to find it out by actually doing an experiment by turning the machine and seeing actually how many teeth moves if I turn the cylinder by one complete revolution. These data are normally not given in the books. So, one has to do a practical experimentation on the machine and actually find it out. So, in one cycle the 33 teeth gear rotates by 4 teeth only, hence rotational input from 33 teeth gear in this case, this gear is how much? Is 4 by 33 revolution, because only 4 teeth turns in one cycle. So, actual revolution is going to be 4 by 33, that is going to be 0 0.1212, if I take the find out the values. So, one input is this 0 0.1212, another input is 0 0.0395. These two inputs will now be combined together. So, we write A as we have find out 0 0.0395, E we have calculated, F is fraction revolution. So, all are basically fraction revolution for one revolution of the cylinder, the input in the differential gear is coming in terms of fraction revolution only. And these values are this and this A and F value is 1.83. So, movement of the detaching roller, I can write L using the same formula I go. And if I go put this values, I get a value 0 0.189 revolution of the gear, which gear? 25 teeth gear, this gear, this gear output gear in this case is the 25 teeth gear that revolves by 0 0.18 time. So, if this 25 teeth gear revolves by this many revolution, what is the revolution of the detaching roller now? Because this drives goes to detaching roller. So, this one and 87 gear are actually mounted on the same shaft. So, the revolution of the detaching roller is going to be 0 0.189 into 87 by 28 and that I translate into linear movement. 
So, I multiplied by pi into diameter of the individual detecting rollers. So, pi d. So, 0 0.189 into 87 by 28 into pi into 25 that gives me a value 46.1 mm. That is going to be the an approximate value of the detaching roller movement in the backward directions. Roughly we can say 46.1. The actual value in the running state when the machine is running at dynamics condition may be little different, but this is how we can get a, a approximate idea about the movement, backward movement. Similar thing we can do for the forward movement also. So, the forward movement, fractional movement of the arm utilized will still remain same, is not going to change. So, that fourth teeth revolution of the 33 teeth gear for 10 index number in opposite direction. But now what happens that the input through the 33 teeth gear to 21 teeth gear is going to be the opposite direction. The sense is going to change now and that is why the rotation of the detaching roller is also going to change in sense. So, in one case the sense was in the backward directions, now we have to completely change the sense. So, for that the revolution it receives through this system of conjugate cam and link is such that it will give the rotation in the opposite direction now. That is how this part has been designed. And also there is no revolution of 33 teeth gear for almost 20 index number. If you look at the timing diagram and see up to which timing this gear is rotating, you will see the 33 teeth gear is not always turning. It is turning forward, then turning backward and there is a time when it does not turn at all, almost stationary. I mean we cannot perceive if I turn the machine slowly. Maybe when the machine is running at high speed, there may be some little rotation, we do not know, but practically this motion is almost 0. So, in this case f is going to be 0 0.1212, a is going to be 0 0.0395 and e is going to be 1.83 and if I put this value, so what, what has happened in this case? f has become negative in sign because now opposite sense rotation is coming. And we do the same calculation, we will find out that it is turning by the actual linear movement is going to be 62.1 minus means basically means in the opposite directions. So, from there we have to also find out the detaching ruler movement when the input is 0, that is when this 33 teeth gear, this gear when does not rotate at all, in one cycle it turns and it also for some period of time does not turn at all. So, in that timing fractional revolution utilized for forward movement is going to be 0.1579 by 2 y 2, forward movement duration is half the index revolution. Again we have to look back the timing diagram, we will find that almost for 20 index number the wheel does not rotate at all. So, therefore, we are dividing 0 0.1579 by 2 and then we get a value 0 0.0789 and in this, in this duration of time we put a is equal to 0 0.0789, a is 0 with no input is there, remain stationary, e is this, we can find out during this time what is happening? It is going minus 15.99, almost 16 mm is with the linear movement. So, total forward movement that is going to be 62.1 plus again 16, total is 78.1. A negative sign indicates in the other direction it is rotating. So, therefore, one direction movement 78.1, other direction we are getting around 46. That is how 
this no this part of the drive has been designed and we try to understand ki how much the detaching roller is moving in the forward and in the backward directions and due to this we get the overlapping actions or we can say of the two uh, fringes or fringes which come one after the other and therefore the piecing happens so this is all about the drive of the detaching rollers but as i said this is very complex drive the design of the cam and the links are definitely very very challenging and uh, almost is going beyond the scope of this course also there is more uh, you know, relevant for the design engineers and with this we stop it here thank you